Question for you this morning. How many of you have siblings, brothers, sisters, stepbrothers, stepsisters, foster brothers? All right. How many of you as parents have more than one child so your children have siblings? All right. Now, if you had siblings growing up or you spent a lot of time with kids who were like your siblings, did you always get along 100% of the time? No. Remember, we're in church. we got to be honest here. <laughs> I have two younger brothers, and I confess to you, uh, as pastor's kids, kids who are raised in the church, we fought all the time. But if you, how many of you are the oldest of, the, of, of your siblings? All right, so I'm going to talk to all of you just for a moment. As being an oldest sibling, the oldest brother, I empathize with all of you because I understand all of those arguments, all those fights, they were never your fault. It's not your fault that your younger siblings just didn't understand how right you always are. But my brothers and I, we would have many arguments and disagreements, and we would employ some of the greatest rhetoric available when we would disagree. Often this rhetoric would take the form of questions like, why are you so stupid? Which if you've ever had that kind of conversation with a sibling, you know what is the appropriate response when your sibling says something you don't want to hear? Fingers go in the ears. And what do you say? I can't hear you, right? Now, what's interesting is I'm pretty sure uh, based on current political debates, that is the technique that's being taught to most of our politicians these days. But, but, isn't it interesting, putting the fingers in the ears to not hear someone is exactly what we just read in our scripture, isn't it? The high priest, the Sanhedrin, the Sanhedrin was the Jewish ruling council. These were the people who were the who's who in Israel, the Jewish leaders, the teachers of the law, the priests, the scribes. The people who had power. And what were they doing in our scripture reading today when Stephen was talking? Fingers in the ears. And they were yelling, weren't they? Because they didn't want to hear him. The question is, why? Why were they so upset? Why were they willing to employ such a childish method in this conversation with Stephen. And that's what we're going to find out today. That's what we're going to explore the why. Why were they so angry with Stephen? So right now, I want you to turn to the person sitting next to you, and I want you to let them know, say, good morning. I want you to remember to take your fingers out of your ears and listen up because this is important. In order for us to answer this why, we need to go back a little bit in our scripture. We actually need to go back to Acts chapter 6, verse 8. In Acts chapter 6, verse 8, we see the beginnings of the why the high priest and the Sanhedrin are so angry. So again, Acts chapter 6, verse 8. Now Stephen, a man full of God's grace and power, performed great wonders and signs among the people. Now, wonders and signs, this isn't Stephen doing a magic trick, right? He's not, oh, aha, uh -huh. ooh. All right, I know some of you, that was a mind blower. All right, but what's he doing? What are these wonders and signs? These are wonders and signs from God, from the Holy Spirit, performing miracles. And people are hearing from Stephen about Jesus. Now, if you don't know much about Stephen, let me give you a very quick history. So in the early church, the early church was growing rapidly. At this point in time, it's almost 5,000 members. And there's a bit of a problem because the original disciples, Jesus's 12 disciples, minus Judas, now with another disciple named Matthias, they can't handle all the needs of these 5,000 people. And one of the biggest needs that they can't handle is the distribution of food. 
distribution of food, especially to the poor widows. And there's disagreement among the people because they're not feeling like they're getting their fair share of food. So the disciples, the apostles, they appoint seven men, seven deacons to be in charge of the distribution of food. Stephen is one of those deacons. But Stephen doesn't just distribute food. Stephen also preaches. He teaches and he performs signs. Now, last week we talked about what happened when the apostles were healing people. Is the high priest all good when the apostles are healing people in the name of Jesus? Does he say, wow, that's great. People are being healed. The lame are walking. Those with demonic spirits are being freed. Is he saying, yes, continue the ministry? No. No, he's not. In fact, he's very, very angry. He's very jealous of what this early church, these early Jesus followers are doing because it is a threat to the power of the temple and his authority. And so they start to argue with Stephen. If we go to verse 10, Acts chapter 6, verse 10, and we see that when they try to argue, they can't because what does it say? They could not stand up against the wisdom the spirit gave him, Stephen, as he spoke. You see, the high priest makes the mistake. He's not just taking on Stephen the man, is he? He's taking on the Holy Spirit. And in case you're keeping score, man versus Holy Spirit, man versus God, who's going to win that fight? God, every single time. And so they can't argue with him. And so what do they do? Right? They, they, they get together, the high priest and the Sanhedrin, and they say, you know what? We can tell he is from God. He speaks with the Holy Spirit. So instead of fighting against him, let's listen to him and let's join him. Is that what they do? No, not at all. In fact, they do the opposite. We go to verse 11. They secretly persuade some men to speak against him. They persuade some men to say, we have heard Stephen speak blasphemous words against Moses and against God. So they're stirring up the people. Now, when they say secretly persuade, that is also very possible. They're paying people off, paying them off to be false witnesses. And then they get Stephen, they seize him, and they put him on trial. They put him on trial in front of the whole Jewish ruling council, the most important people in Jerusalem. He has to stand trial. And what happens when he goes to trial? When we go to verse 13, they produced what kind of witnesses? False witnesses. You might want to circle underline that. Who testified, this fellow never stopped speaking against this holy place, which is the temple, and against the law, the law of Moses. Now, I want you to do a little memory work. Don't worry, you don't have to quote any Bible verses back. But think about this scenario. Stephen is in front of the whole Sanhedrin. He's being put on trial, and they bring false witnesses in to testify against him, saying that he's speaking against the temple and the laws of Moses. Does that sound like something you've heard before? Yes. But it's not Stephen who was on trial a while ago. Who was it? Jesus. Remember, if you know the story, when Jesus is on trial, isn't that the exact same thing that they do? They bring in false witnesses, people that the high priest has paid off. In fact, biblical scholars argue it's very possible. Get this. Those might have been the same false witnesses. The same ones who testified against Jesus are now testifying against Stephen. These are kind of like professional false witnesses. Hey, Joe, what do you do for a living? Oh, I lie for the high priest. But think about that. They're using the same setup, the same trap that they tried to use against Jesus. Now they're using against Stephen. They're hoping to intimidate him, to threaten him. They're hoping he will recant, that he will take back everything he's saying about Jesus, how Jesus died on a cross, how Jesus three days later came back to life, how salvation is found in Jesus. They're hoping he'll say, you know what? I'll shut up. But is that what Stephen's going to do? No. If you 
have a chance, if you've never read Acts chapter 7, the whole chapter, I highly recommend it. Because what Stephen does in front of the most powerful men in Jerusalem is he delivers not just a sermon, he gives a history lesson. And that's what Acts chapter 7 pretty much is. It is a history lesson of the Old Testament. It is a history lesson of the people of Israel. And he kind of goes through talking about from Abraham to Moses. And do you know what he keeps pointing out over and over again? That throughout the history of Israel, throughout the history of the Old Testament, you have always been breaking the laws of Moses. And you have never listened to God's prophets. And they can't argue against it because it's fact. He talks about how when they're in the wilderness with Moses, they wouldn't listen. They built a golden calf. When Moses doesn't come down from the mountain, they start worshiping a fake God. And he says over and over again, you always were breaking the laws of Moses. You weren't obeying God throughout our history. And he ends that speech with chapter 7, verse 51. And he says the following, you stiff-necked people, your hearts and ears are still uncircumcised. One part of you was circumcised, but the rest has got a lot of work to do. You are just like your ancestors. You always resist the what? Holy Spirit. He's saying what you're doing right now is what we've been doing throughout our history. Then he lets them know. Just like you have killed the prophets of God throughout our history, that when the Son of God, the Messiah, showed up, you killed him. That's what we call the mic drop moment. He lets them know exactly what they've been doing. He's not speaking against the temple. He's not speaking against the laws of Moses. He is speaking against generations of people who haven't obeyed God. And the greatest act of that disobedience is killing the Son of God. Drop the mic. Now, go to verse 54. Why are they so upset? Because that's what they just heard. Why are they so upset? Because instead of acknowledging that's exactly true, what do they do? Look at verse 54. When the members of the Sanhedrin heard this, they were furious and gnashed their teeth at him. Now, I've been upset in my life. I've had some pretty hard things happen to me, but I cannot recall a time when I did any teeth gnashing. I don't know about you. Maybe you've had some teeth gnashing moments. Hopefully you haven't. Your dentist would probably not enjoy that. But think about that. They are so furious. They are gnashing their teeth. Now, that, that to me is more like an animalistic response, isn't it? That sounds more like a pack of velociraptors than it does people. They are gnashing their teeth. Just picture, maybe you think of cartoons, right? You know, in a cartoon, when someone's upset, they get the smoke coming out of their ears. That's kind of what you picture right here, isn't it? Right? Angry, angry. They're furious because they don't want to admit the truth. They don't want to acknowledge, yeah, we have a history of not obeying God. No, no, no. Instead, they do what so many people do. So many people have been doing since the history of time. They deflect. Right? No, Stephen, you're the problem. And so they're gnashing their teeth at him. And as they're gnashing their teeth, God gives Stephen a sign to let Stephen know, Stephen, I am with you. And look at that sign in verses 55 through 56. But Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, looked up to heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Look, he said, I see heaven open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. God gives Stephen a vision of heaven. Does the high priest and the Sanhedrin want to hear about that? No, oh, no, because how did they respond? What did they do in verse 57? Plug the ears, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. They are so angry, they don't want to hear it. And especially, they don't want to hear about Jesus being up there with God. And so they plug their ears, they yell, they scream, and then they grab Stephen, they take him outside of the city, 
And what do they do? They stone him. They kill him. They throw rocks at him until he is dead. And that's the story of Stephen. That's it. That's his life. Right? He helps distribute food. He preaches, performs signs, gives a history lesson, sees a vision of heaven, and he dies. That's it. That's Stephen. Most likely, he was rather young. And that was his end. He dies at the hands of the Sanhedrin. That's it. And the question that we might ask as we look at the life of Stephen is why? Why did Stephen do it? Why did he do it? Why did he stand up to the high priest in the Sanhedrin and refuse to back down? Why wasn't he more careful? Why didn't he just stop? Why did he do it? Why did he continue to share about Jesus even when he knew the dangers? Why? We could say, well, maybe he was crazy. Maybe he was just kind of dumb, oblivious. I don't think so. Maybe he was suicidal. He wanted to die. No, no. Stephen was determined. He was determined that his life would be a witness for Jesus. He was determined that his life would all point to Jesus. In fact, in his very last breath of life, as rocks are pounding his body, hitting him in the head. Blood is probably flying. What does Stephen do? What is his last gasp of breath used for? We'll take a look at verse 60. What does he say as they're throwing rocks, these men murdering him? What does he say? Then he fell on his knees and cried out, what? Lord, do not hold this sin against them. Well, what's he doing? He's asking God to forgive the people who are killing him. Wow. Is that a witness? Is that determination to live your life, every second of your life for Jesus? Yeah. And you might say, wow, how did he do that? How could he ask for forgiveness for the people who were killing him? Because if you know in history, historical examples, especially of non-Christian people, when they are being executed in a public display of execution, and perhaps a rather horrible way to die, do they usually ask for forgiveness from the people who are killing them? No, what do people do? You may have seen movies, right? In their last breaths of life, they're calling out for revenge, right? They're calling down curses. Sometimes they're even calling out to God, saying, smite my enemies. Is that what Stephen's doing? No. He's saying, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. Father, please forgive them. How could he do that? You know how Stephen could do that? Because Stephen was living his life as a witness for Jesus. And Stephen had a great example in our Savior, Jesus Maybe this little scene with Stephen also reminds you of something about Jesus, right? If we go to Luke chapter 23, verse 34, perhaps you've heard this before as well. When Jesus is on the cross, nails in his hands and his feet, blood dripping down from his body, his mangled body dying on the cross. What does Jesus say? Father, forgive them for they do not know what they are doing. As the people are mocking him, the soldiers are tearing up his clothes and casting lots. As his life is leaving his body, what does Jesus say? Father, forgive them. How was Stephen able to forgive? Because he knew Jesus. Because Jesus set the example. Because Jesus showed us how we can forgive even those who persecute against us. So that's the life of Stephen. And my question for us today, as we look at that life, is can I be a witness like that? Stephen literally used every breath to be a witness for Jesus. Can I do that? 
Can I be a witness to the people I disagree with? Can I be a witness to the people who have hurt me and wronged me? Can I be a witness to the people that I don't like? Can I be a witness using every part of my life to show this world who Jesus is and that I'm a follower of Jesus? If Stephen was here, you know what his answer would be? No, you can't. At least not on your own. Stephen would say, there was nothing special about me. But I had the Holy Spirit in me. And he would say, you also can be a witness like that. If you let the Holy Spirit work in you. If you surrender your life to the Holy Spirit, to God, to Jesus, you too can be a determined witness using every last breath of life to point people to Jesus. Not on our own, only through the power of the Holy Spirit. Now you might look at this with a bit of an eye of cynicism. And you might say, okay, Stephen, great story. Glad you were so determined, glad you could be a witness. But does it really matter? Did he really make a difference? I mean, he is known as the first Christian martyr, the first person to die for Jesus, the per first person in the Christian faith to give the ultimate sacrifice. But we might look and say, did that really make a difference, Stephen? If I live my life like Stephen, is that really going to make a difference? Is it really going to matter? Especially at the end of my life, is that going to make a difference? And the answer for you is, let's look at a couple Bible verses. I know it's a typical pastor response. Let's look at another Bible verse. But I want you to go to Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 through 2. Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 through 2. And as I read these two verses, I want you to think about what we just read in Acts 7. All right, again, Colossians 3, verses 1 through 2. Since then, you have been raised with Christ, set your hearts on things above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on earthly things. Christ seated at the right hand of God. Does that sound like a vision of Stephen? Yep. Set your hearts on things above. Does that sound like something Stephen was doing? Yes. In fact, there's a lot of parallels between Colossians 3, 1 through 2, and Acts 7, and what we just read. All right, so just keep that in mind. We see some parallels. Everybody agree to that? Okay. All right. Now, who wrote, who do we believe wrote the book of Colossians? Paul. Paul is always a safe answer. All right. He wrote probably 13 books in the New Testament. All right. So Paul wrote this, most likely. Most scholars agree Paul wrote Colossians. All right, now, it sounds a lot like chapter 7 of Acts, and we think we're pretty sure Paul wrote it. So let's now go back, all right? Go back to Acts chapter 7. Go to verse 58. So we, we, had, a, we had someone in there that if you weren't really paying close attention, you might have missed it. All right, there's a man in verse 58 who's watching the coats of the people who are killing Stephen. What's his name? Saul. Saul. All right. You say, oh, Saul, Paul. It kind of sounds the same. Guess what? It's even bigger than that because Saul, that guy, Acts 7, he's a young, up and coming Pharisee. Saul's kind of a big deal in the Jewish world. He's a big deal down at the temple. He's a big deal with the teachers of the law. He's this new guy, and he's got, he's got zeal, and he's got power. Well, Saul actually has two names. You see, Saul isn't just a Jewish Pharisee. He's also a Roman citizen. And most Jews who are Roman citizens would have a Hebrew name, but they'd also have a Roman name or a Latin name. His Hebrew name was Saul. His Roman name was Paul. Woo! Are you making the connection? All right. 
Friends, the Bible is all connected. There's no coincidence. It's connected because the Holy Spirit inspired the people who wrote it. God is the ultimate author. And so Saul, who later we'll know as Paul, because he's going to have a road-changing interaction with Jesus himself. If you don't know that story, come back next Sunday. We're going to tell it. All right. That same Saul was there when Stephen died. Now, in that moment, back in Acts chapter 7, was Saul, who would later be called Paul, was he there defending Stephen, supporting him? No. He wanted to see him gone. In fact, Saul probably saw Stephen and all these followers of Jesus as the problem. And he wanted to eliminate the problem. And what did it say? He was there approving of Stephen's death. So I'm sure that Saul watched as Stephen was on his knees praying, Lord, do not hold this against them. And he probably went, I don't need your stinking prayers, Stephen. I'm doing the right thing here. I'm eliminating the problem. And that problem is you. But did Saul hear what Stephen was saying? Sure sounds that way, doesn't it? Because later on in his life, as Paul is in a Roman prison, and he's writing to these Colossians, this church, to encourage them, it sounds a lot like what Stephen said, doesn't it? Does it make a difference to live your life as a witness for Jesus? Does it make a difference even when the people you are trying to love persecute you and hate you? If we look at the life of Saul and his interaction with Stephen, that answer is yes. Yes, it makes a difference, doesn't it? Because even though Saul didn't want to hear it, did Saul remember Stephen? Absolutely. Absolutely. And when he had that encounter with Jesus, Saul remembered exactly those words of Stephen. You say, okay, that's great. Great for Stephen, great for Saul, Paul. Okay, wonderful. What does that mean for me? Here's the thing. How many of you have ever felt in your life that as you try to live for Jesus, and I know we're not perfect people. We make mistakes, but we're trying to live for Jesus, aren't we? How many of you have ever felt that no one's listening? Maybe there's a family member you can think of. Maybe it's a coworker, a neighbor, someone that you've been trying to share Jesus with, but it feels like when you share, they're doing this, aren't they? And you think, why do I even bother? And we can put that into a global perspective, right? We see the world changing. We see the sins of the world all around us. We see trouble. We see problems. We see a world that often feels like when we come and try to share the good news of Jesus, they've got their fingers in their ears and they're saying, la, 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 I can't hear you. I don't want to listen. Do you ever feel that way? Do you ever feel like you're a bit outnumbered? Do you ever feel like no one really wants to hear about your witness of Jesus? Do you ever feel it'd be just a lot easier to live like the world? When someone wrongs you, you just wrong them back. But does it make a difference to be a witness for Jesus? If Stephen was here, he'd say, yes. If Saul, Paul was here, he'd say, yes, it makes a difference. Don't give up. Don't give up in your witness. Even when it feels like everyone around you has got fingers in their ears and they don't want to listen, just know God is with you. God is there. I don't know how many of you have ever been to a sports game where it was really intense. It came down to the last seconds. Maybe it's a football game and it's tied up and your team has the ball and they're on the five yard line and there's only 10 seconds left to play. Or maybe it's a basketball game and it's coming down to the final shot with just a few seconds. 
whatever it is. Have you ever seen a moment like that? Have you ever at least watched that on TV or if you were there in the live audience? And if you're there in the live audience, what are people doing in that moment? Are they just sitting in their chairs going, well, let's just see how this goes out. No, what are they doing? Are they on their feet? Are they on their feet? Are they yelling? Are they trying to support their team? Right, as fans, that's what we do, right? We think if I just yell loud enough, if I just cheer loud enough, then I can push my team to win, right? We get on our feet and we say, come on, you can do it. You know what? My favorite part of this scripture we read today, it was the come on, you can do it moment. Maybe you didn't catch it. If you go back to verse 56, you'll see it. Normally, when we talk about Jesus, we talk about Jesus being at the right hand of God. But what, what is he doing? He is seated at the right hand of God, right? You've probably heard that before. In fact, if you go back and you look at Mark uh, chapter 16, you'll have to look it up now. But when Jesus ascends, Mark talks about when he ascends, he goes and he is seated. He sits at the right hand of God. We'll look at Acts 7, verse 56. Is Jesus sitting? No, what's he doing? He's standing. He's standing. Do you know why he's standing? Because Jesus looks down at Stephen and he gets to his feet. He says, come on, Stephen. Come on. You got this, Stephen. Finish strong, Stephen. I'm cheering for you, Stephen. And Stephen, in just a few moments, you're going to be standing right next to me. Friends, I want you to picture that. Picture Jesus standing, clapping, cheering, because that's what he's doing for you. He sees you. He sees your struggle. And he doesn't look down with indifference. He doesn't sit there twiddling his thumbs and says, well, good luck, Dave. Let's see how it turns out. Oh, no. When we are trying to live our life for him, he's not sitting. He's standing. He is standing and he says, I am with you. Come on. Come on. You can do it. Don't listen to the world. You can do it. I am with you. I'm standing for you. And here's the thing that you probably know, but I think we need to remember over and over again. If you've been surrounded by people your whole life with their fingers and their ears not listening, or maybe you were that person that you had selected fingers, right? I come to church, I take them out. When I go back to work, I'm putting them back in. I want you to hear this. When you witness for Jesus, it's not up to you to change hearts. God's got that under control. God will change the hearts of even the hardest people. It's up to us to just live for Jesus, to let our words, our actions be a witness so that people, when they look at their, our life, they may not like what we're doing. They may not like who we are. They might keep their ears plugged in, but they will remember. They will remember your faith, your witness. They will remember that you love because Jesus loves you. They will remember that you forgave because Jesus forgives you. And they are on your heart, and Jesus loves them, and Jesus is standing and cheering for you, saying, come on, come on, you got this, you got this, I'm with you, amen.